Welcome to my channel. This is today's episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get to that, I do want to thank you for coming to my channel. <clears throat> for coming from all over the world to watch my videos. And for supporting me and for the fantastic comments that you make. I really do appreciate it. The first thing that I have today <clears throat> is an article about five major cases by the U.S. Supreme Court that will be decided this summer. The first case is called Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo. <coughs> In Loper, the court will decide whether to revisit the doctrine of so-called Chevron deference. That legal precedent holds that federal judges must defer to executive agencies' interpretation of the law, thereby handing unelected bureaucrats the power to essentially make law by deciding what the law means. Court observers are saying that, that, will, that the court will likely rule against them, which will uh, have significant impact on administrative agencies. And that's a good thing. We don't need bureaucrats who are, don't even answer to the people deciding what we can and can't do. The second case is Murthy v. Missouri. And that, that's the case where the government was sued for using third-party agencies to try and censor speech by getting the big tech companies like Facebook and Twitter to remove posts or, or shadow ban them or make them less visible. And court observers are saying that the uh, court is likely to, to uh, side with the government on this one. I certainly hope not because it just makes no sense to me at all that they would. I mean, the government is not the government should not be allowed to censor speech at all under any circumstances for any reason. There may be a few exceptions, but not many. The third case is City of Grants Pass, Oregon versus Johnson. This is a case where a city was fining people for living on the streets and sleeping on public property, and the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals said they couldn't do that, and so it's before the Supreme Court. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. According to the court observers, they think that the court will side with the cities on this one. The fourth one is FDA versus, uh, v Alliance for Hi versus the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. And in this one, uh, the court heard arguments pertaining to access to mifepristone, which is a common abortion-inducing drug. And court observers expect them to allow that drug to still be administered. And finally, there's Trump versus United States, which is probably the most important case that is before the Supreme Court right now. And in that case, uh, Trump is arguing that acts that he performed while he was president are legally immune from criminal charges because they took place as official acts when he took office. And court observers think that the court is going to side with Trump at least on some of the issues, which would mean that the case against him would have to be redone. It would have to be rewritten and new charges filed for the things that wouldn't come under the uh, purview of immunity. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with all those five cases, and uh, a couple of them. The one, the one that uh, the Chevron deference case and the Trump case could have a major impact on our future. The second article that I have is the verdict is in the the Amish approach to COVID was superior, and this one I found very interesting because it involves a lot of different things uh, that we've talked about before, but that impact our lives greatly. In this article, um, the Amish uh, 
if you don't know who the Amish are, maybe, you know, if you don't live in America, you might not know the Amish are a Christian group, and they're, they're kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a polite way to put it, old-fashioned, I guess you could say. Um, they don't believe in the use of electricity. They don't believe in motorized vehicles. And they have very tight-knit communities that they live in, and they ride in horse-drawn carriages in 2024. So uh, when the COVID-19 uh, virus broke out, the Amish said, uh, we're not going to do what you're telling us to do. And so after a brief uh, shutdown in the beginning, the Amish chose a different path that led to COVID tearing through the community at warp speed. It began with an important religious holiday in May of 2020. When they take communion, they dump their wine into a cup and they take turns to drink out of the cup, Calvin Lapp explained to me. He's an Amish Mennonite living in the largest Amish community in the U.S., centered in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So you go the whole way down the line and everybody drinks out of that cup. If one person has coronavirus, the rest of the church is going to get coronavirus. The first time they went back to church, everybody got coronavirus. Lapp says the Amish aren't, weren't denying COVID. They were facing it head on. It's a worse thing to quit working than dying. Working is more important than dying, he says. But to shut down and say that we can't go to church and can't get together with family, we can't see our old people in the hospital, we got to quit working, it's going completely against everything that we believe. You're changing our culture completely to try to act like they wanted us to act the last year. And we're just not going to do that. So, what happened? Well, they, everybody got COVID. And some of them died. But the reactions from outside are interesting. <clears throat> A history professor who studies the Amish declared in an email that the Amish approach to COVID had failed because, he said... Amish excess deaths nationally shot up from September to November of 2021, matching the national pattern in deaths. He seemed to have no realization that he was making the opposite point than what he intended. If Amish death rates truly match the national pattern, which is what he claims, while the Amish avoided shutdowns, masking, isolation, experimental vaccines, and all the expense then wasn't the Amish approach superior? Furthermore, if Amish deaths truly shot up during the same short time period, equaling the national pattern, doesn't that imply that their deaths had been lower than the rest of the nation for a critical time prior to that? And lastly, it's unclear what data the professor was using to make his claim about the number of Amish COVID deaths since nobody was able to track them with any precision. So, Basically, he made up his statistics. I don't know why you would be surprised about that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the modern day academe has no uh, desire whatsoever to do truthful and accurate research. All they care is about their narratives. They become completely politicized. There was a study done by a professor at West, West Virginia University. And so this, the author of this article contacted the professor and said, why did you exclude Pennsylvania from your study? She provided a surprising answer. She indicated that she and her colleagues chose Ohio because it had a dispro disproportionately high number of Amish and Mennonite obituaries compared to Pennsylvania and other states. According to Stein, Ohio is home to approximately 23% of the U.S. Amish population, but contributed 56% of the total obituaries published, and Pennsylvania was not represented by the, to the same degree as Ohio in the data. Incredibly, this seems to mean that when they saw evidence of a more positive outcome in Pennsylvania, fewer obituaries, they excluded that data from their study. So, just like in many cases nowadays, they had a goal in mind with this study. They wanted to achieve a certain end, which is to say that the Amish way that they handled the virus 
was wrong. And so they just exclude the data that, that contradicts their argument. Instead of looking at all the data and say, saying, here's what we see, they cherry pick the data that supports their argument. That's modern day academia. And it's everywhere in the United States. I don't know about overseas. I, I, I don't know if uh, Europe has gotten infected with that yet or not. I'd have a hard time believing that it hasn't been, but, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you European folks will have to tell me that. The next article I have is called The Desire to Silence Others is Unhealthy. And it's another article about how free speech means you have to be willing to listen to people with whom you vehemently disagree. I'm just going to read the last part of it. And of course, the links will be in the description for you. I'm obsessed with getting the facts right. That's why one quarter of my books are comprised of endnotes with references to the best available data. I write to have an argument. It has never crossed my mind to want the government to prevent my critics from writing or speaking. That desire on the part of so many other people betrays a lack of confidence, deep-seated entitlement, and arrogance. One of my favorite things about Glenn, he's talking about a professor uh, who is well-known and, and takes, he's a black professor and he takes a, uh, a very honest look at data. And he has a podcast. Can't remember what his name is right off the top of my head. Glenn Lowry. He has a podcast where he uh, interacts with other people and asks them questions and things. But he's a very well-known professor and he's very open-minded and very, um, I would call it old school because he doesn't just buy and swallow the narratives. He, he questions them. So, one of my favorite things about Glenn is that he has every right to be arrogant, and yet he isn't. Despite being an intellectual heavyweight, he is open-minded, curious, and incredibly humble. His own life story, which I'm eager to read, may provide insights into the source of his humility. As such, Glenn should change, should change how we think about what it means to be a great public intellectual. It's not just about being brilliant and productive. It's also about remaining open to the possibility that each of us still has so much to learn. I, you know, I've been this way all my life and I don't, I can't, I can't say I don't understand. I know why people don't do that because they have agendas that they want to accomplish, but it just irritates me to know end that people can't look at data openly and, and, change their mind if the data says it shouldn't be the way you think it is or it isn't the way you think it is but so many people when they look at studies they'll say well that can't be true because they didn't believe it before they looked at the study and so they're they're not looking at it with an open mind they're not looking at it with an with a desire to learn they're just looking at it to either confirm or refute, uh, confirm what they believe or refute what they don't believe. That's it. And then this last article is a true bipartisan scandal. And this is about the United States, but I guarantee you this is going on in other countries as well. So don't think that you're immune from this because you're not. Last October, current and former congressional staffers from both parties began receiving curious notices they came from google which obeyed years of gag orders before finally informing house and senate aides legal advisors even members of congress themselves that their gmail messages and google phone records had been turned over to the justice department as part of a leak investigation former senate judiciary committee chief investigative counsel jason foster now at Empower Oversight, received a notice on October 19th last year telling him the Justice Department obtained records for his Gmail account as well as two Google Voice telephone numbers connected to his family's telephones and his official work phone back in 2017. At that time, he was coordinating with confidential sources and whistleblowers for the Judiciary Committee, 
a number of senior congressional staffers from both parties with access to sensitive information were similarly targeted. Taken in conjunction with the other recent disclosures, former Intelligence Committee Chairman and Democratic heavyweight Adam Schiff and former presidential candidate Eric Swalwell received similar notices from Apple in 2021. These cases show how easily prosecutors now can investigate their own congressional overseers and their families, gaining access to sensitive information about everyone from whistleblowers to confidential sources to the media. What are they doing with that information? Foster is trying to find out. One former Democrat House staffer reached last night had similar worries. Republicans and Democrats haven't agreed about much in recent years, but this is an institutional problem, he said. All it takes is one or two of these investigations and you can assume the DOJ knows about whistleblowers, personal contacts. You can even imagine a chart of everyone's media relationships. It could be targeted one way or the other depending on who's in the White House. If you're a Democrat, you're worried about this if Trump gets elected, re-elected. Why does this matter? Even though the case was closed, the government continued to demand and receive non-disclosure orders. As the filing notes, even after Wolf's conviction, DOJ requested three additional one-year renewals of the NDOs. It was not until 2023 that DOJ finally relented and allowed the NDOs to expire. Though the state is required to ask for these renewals every year, it can theor theoretically keep seeking renewals indefinitely. That way, targets of these investigations might never learn they've been subject to sweeps, let alone have a chance to contest them. Now, having read all this and understanding what's going on, the obvious natural question that I ask and that you should be asking your congressmen and senators, why did you pass the FISA bill without requiring warrants for American citizens. Why in God's name would you do that? What were you thinking? <sighs> As I do with every video that I make, I pray for you. I pray that you will have an abundant life and that you'll live a long time and that you'll be healthy and that God will keep you safe from harm. I pray that he'll do the same for every person that you love. And I pray most of all that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you will make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Era Vet, out.